pushing your way through the muddied ground, you hear only the deep striking of drums, the pealing of horns, the rattle and crack of powder and ball, the shouting, the screaming, the crying of battle. The horizon above you is smoke and fire, a thick swirling fog of grey as sulphurous fumes are belched by cannon and musketry. Your battalion is marching into battle, badges shining, swords glistening, and colours flying with all the honour and decorum befitting a servant of one's nation and one's sovereign. Already as you approach the maw of combat, the rewards of such service make themselves apparent. They might be seen around you in brown and red. Others, yet unaware of their laurels, limp and crawl past your battalion. Grab at your feet. Plead for salvation. Or some, just for water, to pass their cracked and blackened lips. You grit your teeth and clench your fist, praying that they understand your duty as it was their own. You march onwards under your colors and your drums. Soon enough, your battalion enters more firmly the pandemonium and battle is commenced. Temporal sense collapses as you loose ball after ball into invisible lines of enemy and receive amply that heated stuff in turn. At a point, a cry rings out. A flash of steel shimmers against fouling and smoke. The very ground begins to tremble as a charge is commenced. It is during this great thrust that you stumble, feeling as though a carpenter's hammer has forced back your leg. On attempting another step, the pain shoots through your, your muscles fail, and you fall to the ground. As the battalion passes you on, your fellows stepping round you, you discover that you received a ball to the leg, seated most firmly amidst torn wool and rent flesh. Looking up, you see the backs of your comrades fading into the smog, the martial sound of drums and horns fading. Now you are left surrounded by that which was earlier passed by, the groaning, the screaming, and the crying. And you ask yourself, for the first time perhaps in true earnest, what happens next? Stepping back now from our drama, this is a very common question for those who are interested in 18th century military history. Uh, the narrative of the military hospital uh, and the grim fate which might meet wounded soldiers there is one just as well known as that of the battle which would send the soldiers there to start with. Uh, but what is often less discussed is the space in between. After a soldier is shot or otherwise wounded in a linear battle, what happens to them? How do they get to that hospital? And well, I think a large reason why it's little regarded, particularly in media, is that there really isn't too much complexity to it. Before certain innovations during the Napoleonic Wars, there was very little infrastructure in place to actually relocate wounded soldiers during an engagement. There generally, generally weren't any dedicated stretcher bearers, and certainly there were no medics or corpsmen to accompany a battalion, nor were there very formalized infrastructures in place to accommodate for the wounded on the field itself. Uh, at least, again, not when compared with post-Napoleonic efforts. All too often, it was the responsibility of the wounded men themselves to get off of the battlefield to safety. Take, for example, the case of Shadrick Byfield, a British regular who was serving in Canada during the War of 1812, uh, who had to do exactly that. Uh, in his later book, A Narrative of a Light Company Soldier's Service, uh, Byfield wrote of his experiences during the war, and particularly here, during the Battle of the River Raisin, I'm probably mispronouncing that, uh, on the 22nd of January, 1813, uh, during which he was wounded. Uh, he writes of the experience such. About this time, my comrade on my left hand was killed. It now being light, I saw a man come from the fence when I said to my comrade, There's a man, I'll have a shot at him. Uh, just as I said these words and pulled my trigger, I received a ball under my left ear and fell immediately. In falling, I cut my comrade's leg with my bayonet. He exclaimed, Byfield is dead! To which I replied, I believe I be. And I thought to myself, Is this death, or how men do die? As soon as I had recovered, so as to raise my head from the ground, I crept away upon my hands and knees and saw a sergeant in the rear who said, Byfield, shall I take you to a doctor? I said, never mind me, go back, help the men. 
Uh, I got to a place where the doctor was, who, when it came my turn to be dressed, put a plaster on my neck and ordered me to go to a barn, uh, which was appointed for the reception of the wounded. As I was going, the blood flowed so freely as to force off the plaster. I now saw a man between the woods and asked him what he did there. He told me he was wounded in his leg. I observed to him that had I not been wounded worse than he was, I should go back helping the men. I then asked him to give me a pocket handkerchief to tie around my neck to stop the blood. He replied, I've not got one. I said, if I don't get something, I shall bleed to death. He immediately tore off the tail of his shirt and wound it round my neck. I then got to the barn and lay down with my fellow sufferers. I had not been there long before the doctor came and said, My dear fellows, you that can had better get away, for our men are being terribly cut up, and I fear we shall be all taken. He rode away, but soon returned, saying, My dear fellows, we've taken them all prisoners! At which news I exclaimed, being quite overjoyed, I don't mind about my wounds, since that's the case. Uh, so, a few things to unpack here. Uh, firstly, of course, that Byfield, being wounded, brings himself to the hospital. Now, granted, he was offered aid by his sergeant, and we'll talk about that kind of thing a bit more later on, because it did uh, re relatively regularly happen, but also that he did turn this singular offer down and made his way to hospital alone. The fact that it was only an offer of aid, and that the sergeant didn't directly order an escort for Byfield, is noteworthy here. He's allowed to have that responsibility of walking back alone, even given what appears to be a potentially fatal wound, with what he later says about the strength of the bleeding from his neck. In a more modern practice, you can imagine that a lot of NCOs and officers or medical staff would be far less accommodating of Byfield's uh, fierce independence here. They, they probably wouldn't let him actually go off on his own. They'd probably send someone along like, no, this is ridiculous, you're going to die halfway there. Hey, you, uh, Thompson, go with him, you know, see that he gets to hospital all right. Uh, similarly, after his wound is apparently rather poorly dressed, uh, the regimental surgeon just sends him off to a different location, uh, again alone without any medical accompaniment. And because of this, when the plaster is forced off, Byfield is forced to turn to a fellow enlisted for aid. Uh, incidentally, uh, that other man was also wounded in the leg and is staying in the woods, uh, though we don't get a sense that he's very badly hurt. Uh, had the other wounded man not been there very conveniently, uh, Byfield may have just bled out on his way back to the doctor. Or at least that's what we're led to believe if we trust his assessment of just how bad that wound was. Then, of course, uh, when our battered hero fortunately arrives to where the treated wounded are uh, gathered up, the same doctor comes riding up to inform them of a potential turn of fortune. He doesn't arrange for the wounded to be transported away. He doesn't have the means to do so, odds are, uh, but rather he encourages those that are able to flee to do so. Uh, thankfully, of course, it turns out to be a false alarm. Here's hoping that no deeply wounded men uh, did decide, oh boy, I better get out of here, started hightailing it, and then died along the route before the doctor comes back and says, oh, never mind, guys, don't worry, we, we won, but in any case. Uh, overall, from our modern perspective, a sense is gotten that this medical care is highly irregular, so to say. Uh, again, that there are very few formalized systems in place to actually transport and care for the wounded when compared to the modern, uh, you know, field of combat medicine. Uh, but, of course, we would also be well to note that despite the neck being a most unfortunate place to get shot, that Byfield still doesn't seem that terribly hurt here. At the very least, it, it, he writes this account in such a way that he seems uh, more than capable of moving himself to the rear uh, with full faculty of his senses uh, and then full faculty as well of all of his limbs. So he is, you know, uh, while it's not necessarily the best idea for him to be moving himself alone to the hospital, he is physically capable of doing so uh, without that much of a stretch of the imagination, if that makes any sense. What if that's not necessarily the case? Might he still be expected to move himself to the hospital if he were more severely uh, impaired, so to say. Well, rather unlucky for the man himself, though fortunate for our own purposes, uh, Byfield is again wounded and a tad more severely uh, the next year during a raid on Black Rock, uh, dated the 3rd of August, 1814. And of that experience, he wrote the following. About this time, I received a musket ball through my left arm below the elbow. I went into the rear. One of my comrades, seeing that I was badly wounded, uh, cut off my belts for me and let them drop. I walked to the doctor and desired him to take my arm off. He said it might be cured without it and ordered me to go down to a boat, uh, saying that the wounded men were to cross the river and they, the doctors, would soon follow. 
Byfield's arm was indeed later removed by amputation. Um, Receiving limited aid from his comrades during the battle in the form of his belting being cut off, Byfield is again here making his way independently to the hospital. And there he again receives an order to move on his own to a point still further, and this time really without much at all serious medical attention. Again, we're getting a real sense here that these are irregular practices, again at least when compared to the modern day practices. Uh, in pursuit of a case even more significant, I think we might look across the ocean to the Peninsular War in Spain and the recollections of Rifleman Harris. It was after the Battle of the Miro, the 21st of August in 1808, uh, that Rifleman Harris was met with the following sight. A truce I now found had been concluded, and we lay down to rest for the night. Next day was devoted to the duty of burying the dead and assisting the wounded, carrying the latter off the field into a churchyard near the Miro. Many of the wounded came straggling into this churchyard in search of assistance by themselves. I saw one man, faint with the loss of blood, staggering along and turned to assist him. He was severely wounded in the head, his face being completely encrusted with the blood which had flowed during the night and had now dried. One eyeball was knocked out of the socket and hung down upon his cheek. Not only a deeply severe wound, but a one which this unnamed man had to endure through the night before he was able, by some miracle, to make it back alone to his own army. Such long periods of waiting were also rather common, but we'll discuss that soon enough. Again, here we have a man near to fainting because of the loss of blood, and to say the least, with uh, impaired eyesight, making his way back alone simply because the army was unable to get to him in enough time, as it were, and because there was not the infrastructure in place during the actual battle to bring him back to safety. I, I do want to stress, however, that while many, but perhaps even the majority of men who were wounded in combat during the 18th century would have faced a similarly grim situation, it wasn't always necessarily so, uh, particularly as regards to officers, of course, who are to receive preferential treatment by virtue of their objectively greater value to the army, uh, their more subjectively superior social value, and as well, perhaps most significantly, I think, uh, because in many regiments of their high esteem, which the men may have held them in. So again, I want to go over to the Byfield account, uh, where, uh, once again, at the Battle of the River Raisin, uh, he describes the significant effort which surrounding soldiers take to defend and evacuate uh, one of their wounded officers, even going so far as to place themselves in in a more dangerous forward position to do so. Quote, a field officer, I think a lieutenant colonel, a fell, having received several shots, but was not killed. Four of our men advanced to defend him, one of whom took him up and carried him into the rear. Now, whether this officer was escorted to hospital is not stated, uh, though because he was likely such a high-ranking officer, uh, it would indicate to me that some careful provisions would likely be made, uh, uh, probably by other more junior officers, to at the very least have someone watch over him for the duration of the battle until it's safe to relocate him, uh, if not even to have uh, an ensign or a lieutenant, you know, one of those guys who are not commanding forces in the, bat in the actual field, uh, probably pick him up and taken back themselves. Uh, it was also oftentimes the case that uh, during this time period, officers would be given preferential treatment in the regimental hospitals upon their more carefully assured arrival, uh, at least until the introduction of things like medical triage in the latter days of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, though even with the superior officer class, while you might more commonly expect them to receive that higher priority of care, this still doesn't necessarily mean that there is always a wholly separate infrastructure in place to accommodate that care. Broadly speaking, again, there were no set individuals whose explicit role it was on the battlefield to locate and render aid unto wounded officers. Uh, the closest you might find, again, would be those officers not in an immediate command of any bodies of troops who would be uh, free to aid men on the field uh, wherever necessary or possible, uh, again, usually being people like ensigns and lieutenants. Uh, and in those instances where love and loyalty to one's officers happen to be uh, lacking Lacking, perhaps, beyond the appropriate measure of a well-maintained corps, well, these unofficial systems might very easily start to break down. You can imagine that if the formalized ones are able to break down, well, the more informal ones very readily might do so.
Uh, it's a common theme in the army, of course, that you'd best keep on people's good side as your, uh, your life may depend on it one day, uh, and that is particularly true during the 18th century. Uh, there's a very interesting account from Joseph Plum Martin, a uh, militiaman and then later a Continental Army soldier during the American War of Independence, which I think excellently shows uh, just how uh, significant the potential role which these uh, personal relationships, and not just professional ones, uh, can play in combat. Uh, it's during the Battle of Monmouth, 28th June 1778, that one of Martin's officers is rather severely wounded by cannon shot, and yet the NCO that's tasked with bringing him to the hospital is a little shall we say, less than eager to save the life of the dying man, even though he is an officer. Uh, Martin writes the following. The first shot they gave us from this piece, uh, being a small cannon, uh, cut off the thigh bone of a captain just above the knee and the whole heel of a private in the rear of him. Incidentally as well, uh, note that we never actually hear anything about this wounded private after this point. Uh, after the rebels return a hot fire and push the bridge back, Martin continues. After the action and our part of the army had ceased, I went to a well a few rods off, or one rod here being about 16 feet or 5 meters, uh, to get some water. Here I found the wounded captain, mentioned before, lying on the ground, and begging his sergeant, who pretended to have care of him, to help him off the field, or, or he should bleed to death. The sergeant, and a man or two he had with them, uh, were taken up hunting after, after plunder. It grieved me to see the poor man in such distress, and I asked the sergeant why he did not carry his officer to the surgeons. He said he would directly. Directly, said I, why he will die directly. Uh, I then offered to assist them in carrying him to a meeting house a short distance off where the rest of the wounded men and the surgeons were. At length, he condescended to be persuaded to carry him off. I helped him to the place and tarried a few minutes to see the wounded and two or three limbs amputated. And then I returned to my party again. Now, whether this apparent neglect on the part of the sergeant and his men are uh, more to do with the personality of the captain, you know, maybe they don't really like the guy too much, uh, or the NCO, he's just being not, not, not a good man, uh, is not discussed here. Uh, to be sure, it's very interesting that Martin was able to convince him to carry the man to the hospital, given that, uh, at the very least, if the officer survived long enough to tell the story, well, I can't imagine that it would be terribly pleasant for the sergeant who was more interested in plunder than in saving his superior's life. Uh, of course, it's also very possible here that Martin is exaggerating the situation or, or misremembering it. Uh, it's not like he or anyone else mentioned in this video is a perfect narrator. There could be other conditions at play here. But all the same, accounts like this do demonstrate uh, the broad ideas quite nicely. Just because you're an officer doesn't mean you are inherently given that special treatment. It doesn't always mean that you get carried off the field and are surrounded by your colleagues as you die a slow yet poetic death. Uh, no matter what all those portraits and paintings may want to have us believe. Uh, and just as wounded officers are not necessarily escorted off the field in every circumstance, in all decorum and full honors and whatnot, nor are enlisted men or non-commissioned officers always just left behind by their fellows in combat. Uh, again, personal relations here can matter a great deal, even in the fiercest of firefights, and exactly who gets aid brought back, who gets left behind, uh, and then as well, of course, there's always the, just the situation of the combat itself, if people are able to help out or not. Uh, again, there's another wonderfully striking account to be found in the account of Rifleman Harris, uh, which helps to showcase precisely that more uh, social dynamic. Uh, in a minor action, I think it's a few days before the Battle of Rolica, uh, which was fought in August of 1808, uh, he writes of his attending to a wounded NCO. He does this, he says, not due to the man's rank, not because he is uh, you know, bound to do so because of the military hierarchy, uh, but because of his personal feelings towards him though unfortunately to no avail for the poor fellow. A man near me uttered a scream of agony, and looking to the left, once the screech had come, I saw one of our sergeants, named Fraser, uh, sitting in a doubled up position and swaying backwards and forwards, as though he got a terrible pain in his bowels. Uh, he continued to make so much complaint that I arose and went to him, uh, for he was rather a crony of mine. Oh, Harris, said he, as I took him in my arms, I shall die, I shall die, the agony is so great, I cannot bear it. It was, indeed, dreadful to look upon him. The froth came from his mouth, and the perspiration poured from his face. 
Thank heaven he was soon out of pain, and laying him down I returned to my place. Poor fellow, he, he suffered more for the short time that he was dying than any man I think I ever saw in the same circumstances. There, despite being in the midst of a battle, as indeed Harris states earlier that he was actively loading and firing his piece in a prone position when he initially heard that sergeant's cry, uh, the rifleman rushed out to cradle the dying man in his arms. Indeed, had the battle you know, moved somewhat along, or indeed had the sergeant's pain and injuries not been so severe, well, it's not difficult to imagine, given the personal connection here, uh, it's not difficult to imagine you know, uh, Harris taking his old crony and attempting to move him, at the very least, to a more secure position, if not even to the regimental hospital. Though, on the other hand as well, yes, this would have meant his abandoning his other fellows who were already then in the fight. Uh, for a more direct example of a wounded enlisted man being actually helped off the field rather than dying before he could be helped off the field, uh, we can again turn to Joseph Plum Martin. Uh, during the panicked flight of rebel militiamen in the B uh, British landing at Kipps Bay on 15th of September 1776, uh, Martin finds himself fleeing through the woods with a comrade, attempting to find the remainder of their scattered corps. Uh, he soon comes across uh, another band of rebel troops uh, who come under fire from you know, British troops in the woods. Uh, he writes, quote, We soon came in sight of a large party of Americans ahead of us when they were fired upon by another party of the enemy. Uh, they returned but a very few shots, and then scampered off as fast as their legs would carry them. When we came to the ground they had occupied, we here found a wounded man and some of his comrades endeavoring to get him off. I stopped to assist them in constructing a litter of sorts to lay him upon. Uh, after which, uh, as the others are able to bear off their wounded colleague, Martin departs to continue his search for his own men. These are limited examples, I know, but I think that they're still quite useful to see that it is by no means unrealistic or inaccurate to see soldiers stopping their activity and stooping down to help their wounded allies, and not just officers, but NCOs and enlisted men as well. It may not be an outlined duty or a formalized medical evacuation infrastructure, but still we are dealing with people here, and there are always exceptions to the commonalities. Still, of course, it's important not to paint a picture that every wounded man is going to die romantically in the arms of their brothers. Uh, all too often, the image would have looked something closer to how Rifleman Harris describes a charge, uh, again at the Battle of the Miro. Uh, down came the whole line through a tremendous fire of cannon and musketry, and dreadful was the slaughter as they rushed onwards. As they came up with us, we sprang to our feet, gave one hearty cheer, and charged along with them, treading over our own dead and wounded who lay in the front. There is only ever so much room to maneuver when you're fighting in dense lines, and only so much space to dance around when the, the dead and the wounded fall in dense piles on the ground. I've not seen any statistics on it, and I'm not sure if it's even possible to have any statistics on this. I'm not aware that any could, that could possibly exist, uh, uh, but I would imagine that uh, a not immaterial number of dead from these engagements were men with initially non-fatal wounds who simply couldn't get out of the way fast enough and were trampled as a result. Now, if a man being wounded in combat was fortunate enough to survive the immediate effects of battle, uh, yet was not quite well enough to make it back on his own to the regimental hospital, uh, or indeed fortunate enough to receive any aid in doing so, uh, his only other hope would be usually to wait, to wait for his comrades to collect him. And that wait may be quite some time, a few hours, a whole night, perhaps even days if it ever came at all. We already saw one example of a man waiting overnight before limping his way back into camp. Another can be found in Byfield's account after a, uh, a confusing nighttime battle where he writes, quote, A volley was then fired upon us, which killed two corporals and wounded a sergeant and several of the men. The company then arose, fired, and charged. The enemy quitted their position. We followed and took three field pieces. In the morning, we collected the wounded and received orders to burn the dead. Beyond these specific accounts, it was an exceedingly common practice for armies to gather their wounded not immediately after a battle, but 
the next morning, the next day. So long, of course, as either only one side remained after the battle, uh, or there was a, tr an, a truce of some kind agreed upon uh, for both armies to move out and to collect their wounded without violence taking place. Uh, it was not uncommon either for local villages and towns to contribute their own efforts in moving the dead and wounded. Uh, such things were generally in their best interest, uh, given the presence of an army right there wanting you to help them find their friends, uh, to say nothing, of course, of the, uh, of the stench, which would unavoidably plague the surrounding countryside, potentially for months after the fact. Uh, such tasks might fall even more specifically upon the pioneers of the army. Uh, these are men of individual regiments who were uh, specifically tasked with marching ahead of the main column to ensure that the roads and pathways were cleared for it to march. Uh, think of them as sort of like proto-army engineers before the Royal Engineers and whatnot came into existence. Uh, uh, Bennett Cuthbertson, a military officer of the 18th century, in his uh, System for the Complete Interior Management and Economy of a Battalion of Infantry, uh, specifically notes that pioneers must be chosen of, quote, sober, resolute, good men uh, for precisely their role in carrying off the wounded. Uh, certainly a task which the irresolute would face with much difficulty. So, uh, again, there may be some limited official capacity of uh, of, of, of wounded collection on their part of the entire affair, but the pioneers alone would, at least in any large engagement, not be sufficient on their own to carry off all the wounded, and it's going to rely again largely on, I think, pioneers to help organize efforts, but large portions of the army to go out and bring them all in alongside surrounding countryside. Uh, of course, sometimes no help would be able to come. Uh, sometimes an army's need for speed on the campaign trail is so dire that wounded men are by necessity left behind and, and never collected, either on the battlefield or on the march route. Uh, particular examples that always come to my mind are the utterly disastrous uh, British retreat to Karuna in 1809, where they did, in fact, in the snow and the ice, often just leave men behind. It's like, well, sorry, Tim, but if you're not able to walk on your own, we got to keep on moving, and so onwards they go. Uh, and then, of course, even more infamous, uh, the French retreat from Moscow in the terrible winter of 1812, which was like that, and uh, but but ten times worse, if you will. Uh, however, of course, despite these many examples being from the Napoleonic era, and indeed despite the larger portion of wounded during this period uh, being treated much the same as in the previous hundred years, uh, we would still be remiss in this discussion of battlefield medicine to not discuss the numerous reforms and innovations which were slowly beginning at least to change the way in which wounded men were taken off the field of battle. Uh, in particular, loath as I am to admit that the, uh, the revolutionaries and their Corsican upstart ever got anything right, uh, a lot of these Napoleonic reforms took place within the French imperial military. Uh, for example, some of the first ever formalized and dedicated corps of stretcher bearers were introduced by the French during the Peninsular War. Uh, they were called uh, brancardiers, which is the uh, likely horribly mispronounced French word for stretcher bearer or litter bearer. Uh, these were teams of two men, uh, each of whom would carry a lance, which uh, sort of doubled uh, as a stretcher pole, you know, one on each side. Uh, and then each man would also wear a sash, which was capable of acting as a half of the stretcher bed. So combining their equipment, they could put together a, a litter for bearing the wounded off of the field. Uh, to be sure, it's hardly the most refined system, but it's certainly much better than using two muskets without a bottom at all. Uh, and then what's more significant, far more significant, uh, is that indeed these men were usually formally organized into units which would be attached to the hospitals and actually be able to follow men in the battlefield itself. It's not a matter of men having to limp their way off the field and then get help, but rather men being able to be assisted after they are wounded. Not necessarily immediately on the front, but certainly a lot closer than the field hospital ever would be. But even more impressive than all of that would be the, uh, the massive reforms of a certain uh, Baron Dominique Jean Leray, who introduced a remarkably modern uh, military ambulance corps, which he termed the Flying Ambulance. There's some uh, ambulance volante, whatever, some French term for it, but the Flying Ambulance. Uh, he named it after Napoleon's flying batteries, uh, the very rapid-moving horse-drawn artillery, which was able to be deployed across the battlefield with remarkable speed, even over very difficult terrain. Uh, Leray took the same basic principle of the horse-drawn artillery and, and created a horse-drawn wagon which would be tasked with bringing men off of the battlefield and to the hospitals further in the rear. 
Uh, these weren't just regular old carts either. Uh, each one was manned by a specifically trained driver and occupied by medically trained individuals, kind of like a modern day medic or a corpsman. And each, each wagon as well would be outfitted with at the very least some basic medical equipment. The idea is that you can have those teams of two, those stretcher bearers with their lances and their sashes and the like, uh, closer to the front, able to pick up the more badly wounded men. And then rather than having those two guys trying to haul the casualties all the way back to the hospital themselves, they bring them to a set location where the flying ambulance is waiting, where at the ambulance they might be receiving some at least initial basic level of care as the ambulance is more rapidly bringing them to behind, you know, to the point where the hospitals are. And then as well, when they reached those regimental hospitals, Leray had also introduced a system of medical triage by which wounded men would be processed and and then treated by virtue of the wounds that they had received, regardless of their nationality, as indeed the French imperial armies were often international armies. Uh, and then as well, even more significantly, uh, even regardless of their rank, at, at least theoretically. Uh, I don't want to make it seem like the French transformed the system overnight. Uh, can't give them that much credit after all, can we? Uh, not every battalion was going to be perfectly outfitted in these ways. Not, not every soldier would have gotten this incredible treatment. Not every officer treated exactly the same as the enlisted men and all that kind of thing. It, it's not like, uh, you know, they instituted these reforms and all of a sudden, bing, bang, boom, warfare was like, you know, out, outright absolutely changed forever, um, but rather um, these were slow, uh, implemental institutional reforms uh, that, you know, they, they take time to take full effect. Uh, this is the beginning of, uh, you know, the modern day infrastructure. What makes these reforms so remarkable is that they were among, if not the, first truly dedicated efforts at creating that comprehensive system of immediate medical care for wounded soldiers and, more importantly, just immediate evacuation for wounded soldiers. At least, again, the first attempts in the early modern and modern time periods. I can't speak to earlier, like ancient or medieval history, things like that. There may have been systems in place. But this is the first truly modern system that we see, the flying ambulance. But it's also important that even where these practices were applied, we remember what made the need for these reforms so apparent to begin with. It's not just the fact that everyone before the Napoleonic Wars was just callous, cold-hearted, or too stupid to realize, like, hmm, maybe we should have a, a system in place to get these guys off the field. No, no, there were material conditions that made this need much more apparent and indeed made the need so much more severe that they could no longer, or at least wanted no longer, to rely on the older, less formalized methods. The Napoleonic Wars were unprecedented in so many ways. Their scale was immense. These weren't just little, you know, cabinet wars anymore between little uh, rival princelings over tax rights or something. These were entire societies, entire civilizations marching to war in an existential fashion. These are, you know, it's not a, a nation fighting for, you know, colonial possessions. This is a nation fighting for their own survival, their very way of existence. Be that, you know, the people themselves, the nationality, the ancien regime, however you want to codify it, these are existential conflicts in one way or another. And that is particularly the case for the French, of course, and their revolution and whatnot, be it for good or bad. Historians refer to this process as the nationalization of war for a reason, and again, particularly in the Republic and the French Empire. And with these armies being raised, again, particularly by the French, uh, being, being of hitherto inconceivable scale, uh, with repeated battles of a hundred thousand men and still more, there had never before been seen such an extraordinary need to deal with such sheer volumes of casualties. Even with these incredible reforms, after an engagement, it could take days or more for armies to collect all of their wounded in even the best scenarios. And again, when you're at war, you don't always have that time. Thank you all very much for watching. Of course, in particular, to my ever-beneficent supporting classes on Patreon.com, for it is by virtue of your support that I am able to carry on with my work. Until the next time, my dear viewer. I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.